Welcome to Channel's Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka from our studios here in London. Over the next half an hour, we'll be looking beyond the business headlines by giving you in-depth perspective on the stories that are affecting all of us. Coming up on today's show, Britain's sickening organised gang violence has claimed the life of Olivia pratt Corbell, a nine-year-old girl who died after being shot dead in her home in the presence of her mother. Festus Akinbosoye, the Bedfordshire Police and Crime Commissioner, will be joining me on the show to assess the root cause that has led to a summer of unprecedented violence here in the UK. And the ruling popular movement for the liberation of Angola appears to have won the country's hotly contested presidential election following the release of provisional results. Ed Nilsson Angelo, a doctoral researcher at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex, will be joining me here in the studio to discuss the fallout. Then later, Desrie Ashomuyide, the CEO and founder of Little Oma, will be joining me to speak about the success of her culturally representative educational produce. But first, as always, let's start the show with a story that continues to make headlines here in the UK, the crippling cost of living crisis. The pressure on Tory leadership contenders Liz Truss and Rishi Shunak to reassure voters has been ramping up throughout their campaign as inflation rises and fears of a recession loom. It is simply unaffordable for millions of people in Britain, and it's already caused huge amounts of privation, debt, anxiety and grief, and it will only get worse as we head into the winter. September 2021, there are about 4 million households across the UK in fuel poverty. This announcement, as we head into October, that's going to jump to about 9 million households, and we know it will get even worse at the next iteration of these price caps in uh, in january well earlier i spoke of our business correspondent simon pusey for more on this developing story simon so this cost of living crisis is no longer a sensationalist headline it really is starting to bite isn't it yeah and we're hearing stories from really across the spectrum of just what kind of consequences it's having on people already we're always talking about the winter and maybe early next year and the kind of effects that we're going to see when um, fuel, fuel prices and energy prices are really, really high. But it's happening right now. Um, inflation at a 40-year high, we know that already. Of course, the war in Ukraine is having an effect on food prices and on energy prices. Um, but if we just go through a couple of things, the leaders of Ireland's largest churches are calling for urgent government support. A nursery is telling children and staff that they will have to wear more clothes to help cut heating costs. Fish and chip shops facing extinction in the Midlands, according to an industry body. Non-league football clubs saying they're considering staging games earlier to avoid flood-like costs. And even firefighters on Teesside, they're forced to use fire, uh, food banks. These are just a couple of the stories that are coming in, and there are obviously so many more from around the country. So it seems like north and south, east and west, this is really having an effect on people. And this isn't even, you know, the winter or, or early next year when we're really being warned to, to watch out. Um, and the, the, the price cap, really, of, um, of energy, of, of heating your home, currently at £1,971 a year, could climb to as high as six thousand pounds next April um, and so I think that's what people are really worried about and they're kind of considering or asking why is the government not doing anything the government current Tory government has been accused of being a, a zombie government because Boris Johnson's been away for a lot of the time obviously it's coincided with the summer holidays but he's got married and then gone on two holidays and obviously now he's in the U Ukraine but he, he seems to be sort of kicking the can down the road in the sense that he says this isn't for me to deal with. Um, there's already this grant of £400 for families, but that's a pittance compared to what people are going to have to put up with. So then people are looking at the Tory candidate rivals, um, Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss, and seeing what they're offering. And Martin Lewis, um, uh, the... the, the um, the, the kind of uh, costs and, and price consumer guru, expert. the consumer expert is saying um, how trivial they're, they're dealing with this. You know, it's tiny little things that they're thinking of doing. Liz Truss saying that she's going to uh, roll back the um, roll back the, the VAT, um, was it VAT? No, it was uh, national, national insurance hike that Rishi yeah. Sunak had put in when not he was enough, though. chancellor. But yeah, and Rishi Sunak saying, well, actually, that's not going to help the economy and it's actually going to make inflation worse. Um, so they're not really dealing with it either. And I think a lot of people are worried about, you know, who's taking this seriously within government? And, you know, we're supposed to somehow get through this. And we've seen so many. And obviously, this is causing strikes. So we're seeing rail and tube strikes, even barristers walking out. It's important to say this isn't just a UK problem. We're seeing this in countries across Europe and even South Africa at the moment having big protests across the country due to similar kind of things, inflation going up. Um, but it, it, you really do need someone to be in charge of this. Why is there not a, uh, a cost of living czar being put in place or, you know, someone within government to be dealing with this? Like, like there's a Brexit minister. You know, how is this not important enough for the government? So I think from a conservative 
points of view, the worry is that they're going to look wildly out of touch, um, given no one in senior government seems to be caring or doing enough about this. And really, the Labour Party should be all over it um, because it's obviously a massive talking point and it's only going to get worse as it, you know, winter, winter approaches. It is. Uh, in the words of Andrew Bailey, the Bank of England governor, it's going to get apocalyptic, um, isn't it? We'll be following this story closely. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Now to our main topic. The fatal shooting of nine-year-old Olivia pratt Corbell in her home has laid bare the issues inner cities in Britain have with organised criminal gangs. At the heart of the violence is the struggle for drugs turf, control of the weapons trade and ultimately a quest for power and respect. Such street battles are common in urban hotspots across this country where poverty and a lack of opportunities is embedded. Well, for more on this shocking spate of violence, I'm now being joined by Festus Akinbasoye, the Bedfordshire Police and Crime Commissioner. Can I just first of all have your initial reaction to news that a nine-year-old girl was shot dead in her home in Liverpool uh, following a summer of pretty extreme violence in this country? I mean, my, my initial thoughts are with the families of this very young girl. Um, no one ever wants to have to experience something like this. It is tragic, it is devastating, and it will be a, a real difficult time for the community, as well as for the family of this young um, girl. And I really do hope that the police get all the support that they need in their investigation to find the perpetrator of this and that they are brought to full justice as well. Absolutely. I think um, many of our viewers would be shocked um, to hear that according to research conducted by expatriate consultancy, two British cities, I believe the first one is Bradford, um, are the most dangerous in Europe. In your opinion um, and in your position as the Bedfordshire uh, Police and Crime uh, Commissioner, what is fueling uh, this increased crime in uh, England at the moment? One thing that we are seeing is that the drugs market is playing an increasingly, uh, that the illicit drugs market is playing an, an increasingly um, growing role in the violence we've seen in our communities. Uh, Britain, according to uh, a piece of research by a dame, um, Carol Black, uh, was found to be one of the um, main drugs market in Europe, uh, especially for class A and class B drugs. So we're talking about cocaine. Uh, and things like that. So the drugs um, that people are buying and using in um, growing quantities in Britain uh, are accounting for some of these um, turf wars and postcode wars that we are seeing in our communities. It's a real challenge, but not all of it is down to drugs. Uh, there's also um, evidence to suggest that you've got generally young men um, who are just fighting over ego, over territories, and they're gang-related, but the a primary driver of the violence we see in our communities is drugs. Um, I, I, I'm glad uh, you uh, brought that up because it leads nicely into my next question because we know anybody who knows the British media know that they're kind of obsessed with sensationalist um, headlines. So they talk about, you know, this is what's happening, but we don't really get to know why it's happening. Do you agree, uh, Festus, with some experts that a lot of this is down to poverty? You know, if, if, if you can't get a job and you've got to pay your bills, you will do whatever it takes to make ends meet. Do you think that's a fair statement? I mean, I'll be very, very reluctant to um, automatically draw the conclusion that poverty is the reason why people are choosing to stab each other. There are many poor people uh, in Britain, um, sadly, uh, and they do not go around um, committing crime. They do not go around killing people. I grew up on a rough council estate in East London. My father had to work three jobs as a cleaner, uh, one in McDonald's, one in uh, with local authority, another one at Burton's menswear. We struggled to make ends meet. Um, neither myself, nor my sister, no one in my family resorted to carrying knives or becoming drug dealers. And there are many people in Britain who are struggling, even especially at this time, and they are not choosing to um, uh, to commit crime. So I, I think we need to be very careful about giving the impression that if you're struggling financially or you've got poverty, uh, then the, uh, an almost automatic consequence would be you're going to resort to violence. But that is not entirely the case. But there are some, there is some evidence to suggest that that happens. But I don't think it is as simple as saying that um, poverty leads to violent crime. The reality, and I've seen this in my role, is that there are even people from uh, middle class families who are buying drugs, who are also selling drugs. So it's not just as straightforward as that.
No, you're absolutely um, right there. And I'm happy you draw the conclusion of what you, you spoke of, uh, your working class upbringing. Many of our viewers will be able to relate to that, including me. But then let's uh, talk about 2022. We're going through the worst cost of living crisis in a generation. You go down some of these old streets uh, that you used to live on in East London. A lot of these youth centres festers have disappeared. There's just not much for people to do. Uh, these uh, football pitches... Uh, um, and these youth centres are now, um, you know, a, a glossy um, houses and private housing, which many people can't um, afford. What are these youths uh, supposed to do? Where are they supposed to hang out? Where are they supposed to find their mentors? What is the Conservative government doing to bridge this gap and to reduce crime? What I can tell you is that um, over the last, just for example, in my in my county, Bedfordshire, where I'm the police and crime commissioner, um, there was a, a program over the summer. There's been a, a program running at the moment called the Holidays, Holiday Activities and Food Program. This is a government initiative. That's a national initiative that gives um, funding to local authorities to provide food activities and uh, and um, uh, program for young people, especially those on free school meals and whose parents are on universal credit, uh, where they're doing things like uh, football, basketball, um, creative writing, dance, boxing. And I have actually partners with, partnered with local authorities in my area to further fund this program for young people to benefit from. This has been repeated across the whole country. And unfortunately, it's not been widely spoken about. But in my area, nearly 15,000 young people will be, will be able to benefit from this. I was able to join them a couple of weeks ago to see how this program is actually landing. So there are programs in place for young people who are the most vulnerable in our communities uh, to keep active, especially with the whole six week period of the summer holidays. But nonetheless, I, I get your point that the kind of uh, the youth club that used to be in place many years ago are not there now. Um, but one thing that, that the government are doing, which is something called the um, Violence Reduction Unit, this has been um, funded through police and crime commissioners in about 19 areas in England and Wales. Mine is one of them. And this is a, a group, uh, an organization that's actually designed to help cut violent crime. And they work with young people who are on the cusp of joining gangs and helping them to come out of this. And they are achieving fantastic results across the country. But let's not um, mistake, be mistaken here. This is not a problem that can be solved by governments alone. Mm. When you've got parents who know, for example, that their kids are in gangs, when you've got parents who are happy to accept money mm. from their children because it helps to buy and pay for things, when you've got parents who themselves are dealing with drugs mm. and we are worried that um, young people are, are joining gangs, I I'm not sure how much more government intervention can take away parental responsibility. Uh, at some point, we've got to realize this is not just down to government or the police alone or to schools alone. There's got to be some responsibility by the adults who know what the children are doing and who are refusing to, to, to make the necessary changes to, make, to, to help keep their, their families safer. Uh, before I let you go, let's move on uh, just briefly and talk about this um, conservative leadership tussle. My goodness, it's been going on an awful long time. Um, Liz Truss and Rishi Shunak vying uh, to take on that poison chalice. Who are you backing? Well, look, my thing is this. Uh, both Rishi and, uh, and Liz are good people. I have met both of them before. Uh, they're very gifted individuals, and both of them, either of them, would be able to do a great job as uh, prime minister for our country based on what they have delivered so far in their uh, respective roles. Uh, but look, you know, we, we have seen democracy in action in Britain and we should all be proud that there is a process uh, where there's a transition from one uh, leader to another. Uh, it's a positive thing. Uh, but in terms of me declaring for one person, I did not declare the previous time publicly and I won't be doing so at the moment. I'm, I'm proud that um, uh, the, the election is going smoothly for the most part. Uh, and uh, whoever wins, I will be more than happy to work with either of them because I think they're both good people who would deliver for Britain. Uh, Festus Akimbusoye, Bedfordshire Police and Crime Commissioner, thank you so much for taking your time out to join us on Channels Business Global today, as always. Thanks, Festus.
Well, coming up on Channel's Business Global, Edmondson Angelo, a doctoral researcher at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex, will be joining me here in the studio to discuss the fallout following this week's presidential elections in Angola. And I'll be speaking with Desiree Ashomoyede, the CEO and founder of Little Omo, about the success of her culturally representative educational produce. All of this after the break. Do stay with us. Welcome back to Channels Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka, from our studios here in London. The ruling popular movement for the liberation of Angola, or the MPLA, appears to have won the country's hotly contested presidential election following the release of provisional results. The victory extends the party's five decades of continuous rule since independence from Portugal in 1975, and it gives President Juan Lorenco a second five-year term. Crippling debt, much of which is owed to China, has eaten up the gains of Angola's oil boom and large swathes of the nation are urging for change. Well, earlier I was joined in the studio by Edmilson Angelo, a doctoral researcher at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex, for more on this story. Edmilson Angelo, it's a pleasure having you here in the Channel's Business Global studio because every time we've spoken in the past, it's been virtual. So glad to have you here. You're not in Angola at the moment, you're in London, although you missed out on this hotly anticipated election. Um, and despite the fact that there have been yearning cries for, from Angolans for political change, right. The MPLA seem to have retained power. What's your response to that? Right. Thank you very much for having me. It is indeed my pleasure to be here finally. Um, again, like you said, um, yesterday Angola witnessed perhaps a, a, a crucial moment in the history of the country. It was the country's um, fifth um, election since the, the country's independence. But this was deemed and was seen and is being proven as one of the most um, disputed elections in the history of the country. Mm -hmm. We never had um, such a competitive election since the end of the war. And uh, this is perhaps something that will mark a new shift within Angolan politics just because of the whole scenario around the elections. You know, it's youth who are the majority of the voters that did not leave the war. Um, they don't have any reflections of the war. For them, it's just a reflection of prosperity and development. Those are the people that have voted the most here. And we have an election, uh, we have an opposition party that is well more organized, that has also probably like won a lot of ground within these elections. But like you said, um, we had got um, the, 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 the results are not fully uh, counted yet. But so far, we have um, had access to um, the previous, the, the, the preliminary results from the electoral commission that shows again that the ruling party has won. But in terms of winning, um, I think they also lost a lot because obviously one of the biggest constituencies, in which is Luanda, has been won by the opposition party, and that changes the whole narrative. This was also the first time that Angolans in the diaspora were able to vote, and the whole diaspora pretty much voted for the opposition party. So even though the ruling party has won in terms of the overall elections, and I think this is what the numbers are showing, yet this is totally different. This is a new um, direction for the country. This is more representation in terms of the opposition in the parliament. This is the youth actually speaking out loud that they want um, change, they want transformation, and they want a, a political change in terms of behavior. Absolutely. I think, you know, you could be speaking about any country here, <laughs> and I'm sure all the millions of views that are watching are saying, here, here, because, you know, it ch changes what is so desperately needed in Africa. I've got to say, the elections were slightly overshadowed, you know, trying to scroll through Western media. Not much uh, coverage, but when you hear about Angola or you read about Angola, we're hearing about uh, the crippling economy, right. we're hearing about high inflation. Right. We spoke uh, recently when you were there. What is the sentiment on the right. ground? Is there anger? Right. Um, do people feel as if money just isn't going as far as it used to? Right. You have to remember that uh, after the Civil War came to an end, we lived perhaps one of the most um, you know, remarkable change in terms of economic growth. Many people saw what we did in terms of a country as a fairy tale story where we came out of a civil war and then we became one of the richest countries in the continent. And obviously for many young people, they saw that as perhaps the prosperity for them to achieve the dreams. But it was very soon clear that much of that money was not going to be, you know, distributed throughout the whole population. And for young people today, they are asking for more. They are asking for um, jobs. They are asking for better um, living conditions. They are asking for um, education, health care. So all these things are there. Even poverty that was, you know, for, for, for quite some time, not really 
really, you know, a, a topic of discussion. Today has become one of the biggest topics of discussion in Angola again. So there's a lot of things that the youth has been trying to speak out throughout the whole five years of, of uh, uh, Lorenzo's um, um, first mandate. But the reality of the matter is that um, the voices are there. And this was indeed the time when the youth, especially through social media, who for, for them now, has become a space of resistance, a place of active participation. They have definitely spoke out and, you know, they, they have passed a message that no one is going to waste the youth here just like that. And I think that's what these elections have done. Goodness, here, here again. What are some of the pressing issues that you think the administration must tackle head on? Right. Like I said, um, even though if we have to look at an assessment of how, how well, you know, Lorenzo has done in terms of the economy, obviously, there has been um, a huge inflection, obviously, even though throughout the, the last year, this has eased a little bit. But the reality is that all of these changes in terms of economic decision did not really translate into changing people's life in terms of everyday um, um, everyday um, changes. But um, some of the issues are obviously around um, unemployment, which is perhaps the biggest question, how are we going to solve this issue? And I think one of the biggest mistakes from the, from, the, from the current government was making the promise of providing half a million jobs. Mm. And the youth has actually begged for those promises now more than ever. Um, obviously, we have issues such as health care, even though there's a mass investment into there, but we still have to find infrastructures to make sure that, that, that it works in an in a effective manner. Um, but there's other issues as well. You know, like I said, poverty, the prices are going extremely high. So everything that, that, that the Angolans have been facing throughout this whole time, I think this is something that whoever leads now is going to have to take into consideration because people are not going to allow, again, things to be the way they, they were. Edmondson Angolo political commentator, I'll describe you as, uh, from the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex. It's such a pleasure listening uh, to your assessments there. Thank it's you. my pleasure. Listening. Thank you very much for having me. Now to our final topic. In case you missed it, my next guest, Desiree Ashomuyide, was trending on Twitter this week as social media users flocked to her account to show their support following the news that her educational toy brand, Little Omo, is now available to buy at the luxury department store Selfridges. The all-inclusive brand is one of the few that represent children of colour through educational products. Desiree joins me from Essex for more on this story. Desiree Ashamoyede, thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. I know uh, you've got young Isaiah playing in the background, so we'll keep it brief. But it's so um, important that we speak to you because you have had a lot of success. But before we get into uh, the celebrations in Selfridges in Oxford Street this week, tell us, first of all, why you decided to make this culturally representative product. So when I was pregnant with Isaiah, I was actually gifted some flashcards and they had predominantly white characters in them. And I thought to myself as being a black woman and also being African and a mother, I just thought, how was I actually going to show my son people that don't represent him? I had to show him someone. And I just found that when I was going on to Amazon and places like that, I would type in flashcards for black children and it would come up with things like a Batman outfit and it didn't have anything represented around black or brown children. So that is basically the reason why I decided to launch the business Little More. A lot of people um, do have uh, these flash of great ideas, especially if you spend, uh, you know, 10 months carrying a baby and then you've got all that time at home. But how did it go from actually being an idea and being inspired to actually being a product that's now available to purchase in Selfridges of all places? Yes. Um, so while I was pregnant, um, I was made redundant from my last job and basically I was just waiting um, to see what I could do within that time. So I started freelancing um, as a fashion stylist and then um, basically lockdown came and I said maybe this is a perfect time to do this idea. So lockdown came and I worked on it for about six months. And then a week before I told my parents and they were like, oh, okay, this is amazing. Launched it and within the first week, the product sold out. And I wow. thought to myself, maybe this is something that I could do long term. And this is what I'm doing now. Little more is my full time. Gosh, I've got to tell you, we're pretty fortunate enough to get you because your product um, is a hot cake and you've had some really um, great mainstream press um, yeah. uh, since um, you launched uh, the product. Um, talk to me about how it managed to find its way into a luxury store such as Selfridges, which is just a stone's throw away uh, from the Channel's London studio. 
Yes. So um, I worked with a lady called Fumi, which is Untapped Creatives, and she works on basically getting Afro Lux brands into Selfridges, which is absolutely amazing. And if I'm honest, I feel like I've never heard of a brand or company that's done something like that. Mm -hmm. So I think what it was for Selfridges is actually seeing a brand that is focusing on diversity and representation for children. And like I said, and you've probably seen, it's like the first inclusive educational toy brand to be sitting in the toy shop in Selfridges and I think that's just amazing as being a woman being a black woman and also being Nigerian it's just absolutely amazing to know that I'm the first and kind of setting the trends for everyone else so yeah well, it's such a wonderful uh, product. I won't be having any more children, uh, but but certainly any time a friend um, or family is having um, a child, we'll be looking at well, your Christmas product. Presents. Yeah. Yes, Desiree Ashomoyede, CEO and founder of Little Omar. Thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. And let's time, let's get you into the studio with little Isaiah too. Amazing. Thank you so much. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for today. But as always, do get in touch with your comments and suggestions. I'll see you at the same time next week for more in-depth business analysis on Channels Business Global. Goodbye.